Well, welcome to our conference. Welcome to Supernatural Encounter. And it's about your encounter with God. And I want you to be open. Sometimes pastors are the most closed up people, especially when it comes to conference. I want you not to be like that. I want you to be open and hungry. Say, God, I've come to meet with you. It's not about the messages that will help, but they're the platform to encounter you. I want to encounter you. Amen? And uh, we welcome those who are overseas watching, watching through television, many different nations. We welcome you. The same presence of God that's here will touch you where you are. God's power is not limited by distance. It will come to you at the end of the meeting as we begin to minister God's power. The same power touching people here will touch you. Every session will be an encounter with God. There'll be teaching, tremendous teaching, and it will inspire you. It will shift you. It will bring revelation. But at the end, it's to lead to an encounter with God. So don't hold back, come forward. Come forward and say, God, I desperately need a touch from you. With that encounter with God, your ministry shifts, your life shifts, everything begins to change and you carry something to minister to people. Not just information, but revelation. Amen? Why don't you open your Bible with me in John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Apostle asked if I would minister on deliverance. I wonder why. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. <laughs> And uh, he asked if I'll open up and minister on deliverance, particularly with reference to uh, issues that would be characteristic in New Zealand. And uh, so I want to do that tonight. And uh, there's sort of a lot of issues you could touch on, I suppose. And I decided I'd touch on one, which I believe is not just New Zealand problem, but it is definitely a New Zealand issue. And it's one which affects all of us. And all of us have gone through experiences, and I know you'll identify with some of these. I want to talk tonight about overcoming the orphan spirit, overcoming the orphan spirit. One of the greatest revelations I've had in my life, which I've carried everywhere I've gone in the world, is a revelation of the Father's love and His embrace and His willingness to welcome us into His heart and to bless us beyond we could ever imagine. In John chapter 14, John chapter 14, Jesus said this, and uh, he said many things. Now, these are his last words. The last words of people are pretty important words. Here he is. I'm going to pick one verse only. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. And this is what he said, very profound statement in verse 18. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Just as I have been your comforter by the Spirit of God, I have been able to minister to you and touch you. I have fathered you in your walk. Now I'm not going to abandon you. It's not the heart of God that we be abandoned. It's not the heart of God that we do life on our own. Jesus made the statement, he connects, he connects these two things. He connects being an orphan and not being an orphan, having someone with you, someone who's standing cheering you on, someone who's guiding you, someone who's protecting you, someone who's blessing you, someone who's bringing revelation to you. So I want to just talk about this area. First of all, we just ask the question, what is an orphan? Now, an orphan in the Bible, uh, referred specifically both Old Testament and New Testament, uh, not to someone who'd lost both parents, but if a person had lost their father, if they lost their father, if there was no father for whatever reason, then the child was called an orphan. And if you were an orphan in the Bible, in that culture, there is no one to protect the family. There's no one to protect you, no one there to provide for you. There's no one there to give you guidance. There's no one there to comfort you. So it's not undermining the role of a mother, but from a biblical and Hebrew perspective, the absence of a father brings destruction and loss into a family. Uh, from the Hebrew point of view, if you were fatherless, if you were orphaned, then you uh, were moved from whatever social standing you had, you became the poor to be looked down on. You were someone who was to be pitied because you were fatherless. To be fatherless is to be an orphan. Both New Testament and Old Testament, the word orphan, the word fa is, is refers to fatherless. So what is the impact of that? I was reading some research recently, and they did some studies in America on single-parent families where they were fatherless. And they found by, as they looked at the trends of people, they examined people in different kind of categories, they found when, a, when a, a child grows up in a fatherless home, he's much more likely to end up in poverty. He's much more likely to suffer in a whole variety of ways. Let me give you a list of some of the things. Uh, number two, drugs and alcohol. Much more likely to end up on drugs and an alcohol. Addicted, trying to fill a pain, fill something but not knowing what it is. Uh, they're much more likely to drop out of school. 
They're much more likely to have health, uh, to suffer ill health, much more likely to have depression, anxiety, and suffer emotional and mental issues. If it's a boy, they're much more likely to, be, uh, to commit crime and end up in jail. If it's a girl, they're much more likely to become pregnant. You can do some research for yourself. There is a dramatic change in society when there's no fathers to leave their homes and to impact and influence the next generation. We kind of look and everyone's trying to find answers for why there's so many problems, but what they're doing is they're just scratching at the fruit. They're not digging down far enough to say, actually, it all happened when the role of the father became disempowered and people were empowered to abandon God's pattern for a family. Say amen to that. Amen to that. So what is an orphan spirit then? We understand an orphan is a person without a father. An orphan spirit is not a demon. Otherwise, you try and cast it out. An orphan spirit, probably the best way to say it would be an orphan mentality. An orphan, it's the, the mindset of an orphan. It's, it's a way of thinking that's the result of experiencing life without being fathered. And people come to certain conclusions when they've not been fathered. They come with certain kinds of conclusions, being no one there to help them. They usually the conclusion a person comes is, I have to do life on my own. It's kind of put into a, a phrase people think, if it's going to be, it's up to me. That's an orphan mentality. Orphan mentality. But underneath the orphan mentality, there are tremendous wounds to the heart, and there are usually issues where demons do torment, do create issues, and cause people to suffer. You can be in a room full of people and still be alone. It's the issue, I'm on my own. I'm having to do life on my own. I gotta make everything go. There's no one there to stand with me. There's no protection, there's no provision, there's no emotional support. I gotta to tough it out. And of course, then the male culture begins to rise up where well, you can't show any signs of weakness or pain. You literally have to tough it up and hide yourself. So I wanna just go a little deeper and I wanna to talk to some things. And, and let's just go further up in John chapter four and let's read in verse seven. And he says, if you'd known me, you would have known my father. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. And they said, and Philip said, Lord, show us the father and it's sufficient for us. And he said, have I been here so long and yet you've not known me? Philip, he who has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? Now you have to understand uh, we, we know that and we preach all kinds of things that Jesus came to do. But I wonder if you've thought of this, that Jesus actually came to reveal God as a father. The, the forefront of his ministry was to make God known that he is a loving, kind, generous, caring father. Uh, most people have an idea of a father. Uh, it, it's shaped out of a patriarchal system. But when we have a look at Jesus, we will find he actually confronted the patriarchal model of what a father looks like. When he confronted the religious leaders, he was confronting a religious representation that did not represent God. It did not reveal the heart of God. Jesus came to make the Father known. That's why he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because it's the Father in me doing the works. I do nothing except what I see the Father doing, for the Father loves me, and he shows me what he's doing, and I do those things. So if you were to go through the Bible again, through the stories of Jesus, and say, this is what Father is like, You'll have your own image of father, and it's usually formed out of the background you've come from, the experience you've had with the father, and it'll be somewhat good, and it'll be somewhat bad, and the proportions vary depending on how bad the dad was or how good the dad was, but there's always a mix. There's good and there's weakness because people are sinful. We have these broken areas in our lives, and we tend to just reproduce them generation after generation. And so Jesus came to reveal what the father's like. So start to look at Jesus, how he interacts with people. And you find he doesn't behave the way we would think people would behave. We find he is caring. We find he is loving. We find he is tender. We find he welcomes people. We find that when people fail, he picks them up. We find he's actually most amazing father. Now, get this. You see, Jesus, it says, he went down at the very end and in John chapter 13. It says he called his disciples together. It says, Jesus, knowing where he came from, knowing where he's going, and knowing, knowing his, what he had, it says he, he took off his garments and girded himself around and washed the disciples' feet. Now, for the culture of the day, the culture of the day, foot washing was something you never did. 
If someone has got dirty feet, they won't have dirty feet because of where they walk, you would take the basin of water and give it to them. You wash your own feet. We don't do feet. It's just well accepted in the Hebrew culture. We don't do feet. So you find in the Bible, every time there was a mention of foot washing, they gave them the basin. You wash your own feet. We don't touch feet. Feet are unclean. So you understand now that the only person that would touch someone's feet was a paid Gentile slave. Now, Jesus girds himself around, kneels down, and washes their feet. What is he doing? He's saying, I'm representing the Father, and this is the heart of the Father to treat you as something precious and valuable. So valuable, he'll come and he will tend to the deepest need you have as though he were a servant. A little later on, Jesus spoke up and he said, uh, he said, he said, you call me Lord and you're right, I am your Lord. But if I, your Lord, have washed your feet, I've given you an example to do the same. In other words, I represent what the Father is like. The Father not only is Lord and powerful, but he's also caring enough to enter the darkest place of your life and love and serve you and bring you back to life again. See, see, we need to shift the mentality of what Father is like. Most of us come, and I found, I've prayed for so many people in so many countries of the world, I find when it comes to prayer, they pray to Jesus, they find Father a little awkward. Why? Because when they try to call God Father, their heart doesn't seem to respond. That's because there's a wounding, there's a pain. And so they literally are still without a father, spiritual father, natural father, emotional father. I want you to go back into, uh, into uh, a scripture in Luke chapter 3, Luke chapter 3. And notice what it says about Adam. We're going to go back into Genesis in a moment. But Adam, it says, uh, the last verse of uh, John chapter 3, it says, Adam, it says the son of the, it's tracking Jesus' genealogy back where he came from. Where is his family? Where did he come from? And so in the Hebrew culture, your family name is very important, where you come from, what family you come from. That's why usually the family name comes first. A son literally means to be a builder of the family name. So if you're a son, you build the family name. See, we, we've lost the concepts from the Bible of what it is. So at the beginning of two of the Gospels, they track back Jesus' genealogy. Why they track it back? For two reasons. Number one, the first reason was he died the death, the most shameful death, the worst kind of shameful death, the most dishonorable death by crucifixion like a common criminal. And secondly, there was some uncertainty about how he got to come into this world. And so the Gospel writers write down, we want to show you and track back that he comes from an honorable family. So they track him back in one Gospel, Matthew to Abraham. They track him back in this Gospel, right back to Adam and then to God. Notice what it calls Adam, the son of God. So notice that God calls Adam the son. Adam, this is my son. It's the first natural son he brought into the world. Adam was his son. Think about that. When you look at creation, in all of creation, how God created was, let there be. He spoke the word and everything came into being. But when it came to man, oh no. I'm not going to stand and just speak a word from a distance. When it came to creating man, the Bible says he took the dust of the earth and with his own hands he fashioned and formed man. He put his handprint on him. And then he breathed life into him. I want you to think about the experience that Adam had when he woke up, when his eyes first opened. Think about this. The first face he saw, his father. The first breath he felt, his father. The first smile he saw, his father. The first countenance he saw, his father. The first kiss he had, his father. I heard someone say at the men's camp, I was out, they say, if your father kisses, if the father kisses his son, the son will never kiss any other man. There's quite a lot of truth in that. When the father has a, a great relationship, the first touch, his father. The first embrace, his father. The first eyes he looked into, the tender, compassionate eyes of the father. The first home he had, his father made it for him. The first assignment he got came from his father. So when we look again at how man was designed, you see the hand of father over it all. How can we minimize the role of a father? without destroying people's lives. 
And so we see there the handprint of God over him. Now we look down. I want you to have a look in Genesis chapter 3. I want to show you some things that, that, that bear on the orphan spirit. We remember the story, and we find out Adam and Eve were in the garden, and they had an assignment. What was, their, what was the garden? What was their home? What was their assignment? Guard the home. Guard the home. Secondly, cultivate the home. So the first assignment we ever get, protect your home, the atmosphere, the environment, the relationships, and cultivate the home so it produces what? Great children. So right there in the very first assignment, we see there God's hand upon him, guiding him. Now, of course, we realize that Adam and Eve were tempted by the devil. Who was the devil? The devil was a, an angel who fell. What was his problem? Here's what, the, here's what the problem was. He did not honor his father. He did not serve his father. He made the decision, I will ascend. I will arise. I will advance myself. I will promote myself. I will ascend on the most high. And what became of him? He became rejected. He became the first orphan. He was full of bitterness, full of hatred, and full of envy when he looked at the family God had created in Adam and Eve. His plan was, I want you to receive my orphan nature. I want you to be cut off from what I was cut off from. I want you to be separated from all that Father is so you can suffer like I suffer. Remember what you put your heart into, you open your life to. So if we let God's words be in our heart, we become open to Him and more like Him. If we listen to the devil's lies, the devil's lies, oh, well, you can't trust God. You really need to get yourself ahead. And then you get this expression, well, God helps them who helps themselves. There's nowhere in the Bible that was the devil's whisper. So I want you to see what happened when they sinned. He says, verse 7, and I want to pick up several things here. Verse 7, the eyes of the boat were opened. They knew they were naked. They didn't know they were naked before. They were now naked because the glory of their father had gone. Then what did they do? They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the day in the garden. And the Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to Adam and said, where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you I was naked? Did you eat the fruit of the tree? I command you not. He said, oh, don't look at me. It's that woman you gave me. Man, I'm just innocent in this altogether. Now, I want to just pick up several things in there that happened as soon as they fell. I want to share several things that happened because what happened when Adam and Eve the Bible says in Luke 4, it says they betrayed their father. They dishonored their father. They brought shame on their father. So what was the consequence of that? The, cons of the first consequence was guilt came into their life. Their innocence was lost. Now they had a pressing weight in their conscience they were never designed to carry, the weight of guilt. I have done something wrong. What can I do to fix it up? Secondly, they carried with that shame. Shame is like a dirty garment that wraps around you. Uh, guilt has to do with your behavior, what you did, but shame has to do with your identity, who you are. Shame is an identity thief. And people can experience shaming in many different kinds of ways, but shame wrap, wraps around, and the message of shame is, I am the problem, there's something wrong with me, I am disfigured, I don't understand what to do to get out of it. When shame is around you, guilt, you can repent and say you're sorry and ask forgiveness and be restored. With shame, you are the problem. It needs someone to lift you up and restore you before you can be free. And then the last emotion they experienced was the emotion of fear, tremendous fear, the fear of being exposed, the fear of being rejected, the fear of punishment, the fear of their father. It says that, Adam, that the Lord God came into the garden in the cool of the day. Now, here's an amazing thing about fathers. Fathers in the evening talk with their children. God would come every evening and talk with his son and talk with his daughter, would interact with them. 
It brings life when fathers talk with their children and talk about their day and talk about what they've been doing and enter into a dialogue. You've got, this is not happened by accident. This is a design that started in the Garden of Eden. How many dads come home and there are no, no, words more, no more words left? All the words are gone. There's nothing to talk about, and all they do is lapse into silence. And so what happened is they had these incredibly painful emotions. The, uh, the emotions are the drivers of the cultures of nations in the world. So if you have a look at the emotion of guilt and the desire for innocence, this is the driving force in the Western culture. Western culture is driven by law. It's driven by the desire to be right and to conceal or to get rid of or avoid guilt. That's only 20% of the world cultures. 70% of the world cultures are honor shame cultures. They are driven by, I want honor. I want status. I want standing. But I fear that I might lose face. I fear that I might be shamed. So you go to the Asian cultures, the African cultures, you go to Polynesian cultures, you go to the Middle East culture, even to this day, what they fear is the loss of honor or the loss of face if you're in Asia. To lose face or to lose honor is to lose the approval of the community. And when you lose the approval of the community and become shamed, then it's very difficult to engage socially, relationally, economically, in any kind of way. They fear to lose honor. Jesus' killing or Jesus' uh, death on the cross was primarily an honor killing. They perceived he'd taken all their honor away when they took the crowds or followed him. We must kill him, but not just any way. We can't just poison him. We can't just knife him in the back. We need to publicly shame him. So the drivers of much of the population of the world is the fear of being put to shame or disgrace. In fact, in some parts in Asia, they, they, they pressure the kids to conform by bringing shame and scolding over their life. And then the last 10% is the area of fear. About 10% of the cultures of the world fear the spirit world, so they become animists. They make offerings to try and get back the power. So Adam, when he sinned, lost innocence, became guilty, and needed to conceal it. Adam, when he sinned, lost his honor, lost his glory, and was covered in shame and needed to hide it. Adam lost his authority and power that he had, immense power, and then he became afraid, filled with fear. The answer of the cross brings an answer to all of these things. Okay, let me just show you a couple of more things. What is the consequence of being orphaned? When people encounter or experience the pain of loss of that connection with the Father, what happens? Well, you can see it, it's laid out very, very clearly. Here's the things that happen, and we'll get to some of the spirits behind it in a moment. Number one, their identity is affected. They covered and concealed who they are. Notice they put coverings, they didn't put it on the head, they put it on those parts of the body where they felt the shame that identified man and woman. So what happens, and we still to this day, when we're orphaned, we tend to cover who we really are, and we put up, in varying degrees, a presentation of what we hope will be accepted. When you do that, you are struggling like an orphan, not being able to be who you are or true to your, who you are. So what happens if you get into church and you have that problem? Now you get caught in the performance trap, wanting position, wanting power, wanting to have the power of God, wanting to do this, wanting to do that, and, and, and fighting for positioning, fighting for recognition. Why? Because no security, an orphan spirit, an orphan mentality. Notice the first thing they did was cover up. The second thing they did was they hid among the trees. They hid among the trees. They hid from father. They hide from intimacy. So the first thing that gets affected by the fall or by fatherlessness is our identity. Fathers bring out identity. Father's role is to call forth identity. But the second thing that happens is intimacy. When you're concealing who you are, you can't be intimate. You can only present so much of yourself. In many marriages, there's no intimacy. Why? Because you've got fatherless woman married to fatherless man. They've both got concealment going on in their life, and there's a, a distance that can't be bridged until the heart is healed, until the issues are resolved. And then the next thing you notice that happened was they began to blame one another. They blame one another, or they refuse to take responsibility. So when we are fatherless, 
We don't own up to being responsible. One of the roles of a father is not just to establish identity and build intimate relationship with sons and daughters. It is also to help them become responsible, to grow up, carry responsibility for their failures as well as their successes, to encourage them in the successes, and to lift them up when they have failures. But if you conceal your failures, you are cutting yourself off for what a father can do. And so churches are full of people doing these things. How can we move powerfully with God if we're concealing who we really are and we're ashamed of who we are and we're afraid someone's going to catch us out? We're going to have to try and control everything. So one of the things that happens is when you can't be free to stand in your identity, how can you move in the supernatural when you need to control what's going on around you so you're not exposed? How can you just have the innocence of a child to enter the kingdom when actually you're concealing your guilt and hiding what's going on in your life? How can you move in the supernatural when you can't connect an intimate way with Father? That's why many of the churches have no supernatural. It's not because God didn't commission us to do it. It's not because God doesn't desire us to do it. It's because in our lives uh, we're lacking intimacy with Father. There's something broken on the inside. You going to be okay? Thank you, Lord. That's right. Father, right now, Father, we just thank you in Jesus' name. Father, I just pray right now in Jesus' name. I just release your presence and power. Touch her right now in Jesus' name. You're going to be okay, dear. Just a healing. Thank you, Lord. Okay? Here's a good one. Well, let's stay where we're going. There's always something happens on the way. <laughs> okay, let's just, I want to just, here's the third thing they, the fourth thing they did. The fourth thing they did. When, when, we're fatherless, there's a struggle to make life work. That's why to people, I, I've been in altar calls all over the world, and I've, I'm interested in the next generation coming up, what I've discovered is this, one of the major issues that comes up is anxiety. Fear, I can't make it. And isn't it interesting, it's coming up in a generation which is fatherless. The other thing that comes up is depression. When you're fatherless, you haven't got someone backing you on saying, go, son, I'm with you all the way. I believe in you. You can make it. I'm going to help you make it. I'll make my resources available. I'll make my strength available. And if you fall down, don't worry. I'll get you up and give you advice how to go forward. That's what fathers do. That's what, you see why life is a struggle if you've got no one like that. It's a struggle if you don't know God like that. And, and so what, what happens is then people struggle to control their environment. So this is one of the things I see. I see churches stuck with controlling spirits everywhere, and they're wanting God. They're praying to God. They love God. They, uh, they want more of God, but the control spirits are everywhere. There is no room for God to move. We want God in a box shaped in our image. But the Bible says God is a supernatural God. God is a God who casts out demons. God is a God who heals the sick. God is a God who transforms lives. God is a God of miracles. That is what our God is like. And when we bring it down and it's just a little God in a box to please man, that's because we're carrying shame. We're carrying guilt. We're trying to control. We're trying to control the narrative, control what's going on. That's not what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to confront that very thing. We need to be willing to do that too as pastors and leaders. Starts with us. Starts with us, doesn't it, eh? Starts with us. Let me give you a few more thoughts about this. When you have a look in Luke, uh, Luke chapter 15, Luke 15, Luke 15, if you read in Luke chapter 15, it's a very familiar story, and uh, I won't go into the details of the story, I just want to pick up one thing. All the tax collectors and sinners drew near to Jesus to hear him, but the Pharisees and scribes, or the church and its leadership, complained. What were they finding wrong with Jesus? This man welcomes sinners and honors them by eating with them. Isn't that an amazing thing? The chief criticism they had was Jesus wasn't acting like a real preacher should do. See, a real preacher should keep himself from the sinners so that he doesn't get defiled by them, so he surrounds himself with people. He won't get near people. In case people defile him, he might lose something. And so the Pharisees kept themselves separate from ordinary people. You had to change before you could belong. 
change or you can't belong. So here comes the latest rabbi who's getting the following. What he does is he finds the sinners. Who does he find? Tax collectors. The, they were called the traitors. They were the worst of all. Then everyone else is just a sinner. The homosexuals, drug addicts, prostitutes, all of those people were there. And he welcomes them all. Welcome, welcome. And then what does he do? He eats with them, which in Asia and the Middle East, it's honoring them. And the, the religious people say, but they don't deserve honor. He's saying, listen, you need to understand my father's heart. And he tells a story about two sons, and one son dishonors his father, walks into the world. What happens when you dishonor father and walk away? Your life will not go well. Ephesians 6 verse 2, dishonor or honor your parents, honor your parents, father and mother, they may go well for you and that you may live long. When you dishonor them for whatever reason, life does not go well. Dishonor God, life does not go well. Dishonor your parents, life does not go well. You end up where you didn't expect to be. When I do counseling, one of the first things I look for is to track a problem back, is the fruit you're bearing today related to dishonor that went right back in your life? Is there been a dishonoring a father, a dishonoring a mother? Is there something been going on in the area of dishonor that now is manifesting a fruit in your life that you need to deal with? You don't need a deep fix. You need to face the issue you've been running from that actually you're operating like an orphan, you've rebelled, dishonored your parents, and then it leads to a path downwards. We see the man rejected, we see the man in bondage, we see the man connected to the pig farmer, meaning he's addicted to things to support him, there's no other way he can get ahead. He returns to his father. The second son, he's the religious one. He also dishonors his father. How does he dishonor the father? He won't go into the meeting, he won't go into the party. In the the Middle East culture, you don't go into the party and you're the oldest son, you've dishonored, disgraced your father, you're in for a toweling later on. He dishonors his father. Why? Because he resents the treatment the other son's getting. He doesn't have the father's heart. He is literally an emotional orphan. When you're an emotional orphan and you're religious, then you judge people, you reject people, you blame people, you criticize people. You can't see the good that's been in your life. But the father goes to meet him as well because the father's plan is to restore everyone. That's the heart of God. Jesus is virtually saying in the story, If you have trouble with father eating with people, how are you going to handle a father that runs to them and hugs them, kisses them, makes them welcome, doesn't say anything except put on my robe, put on my ring of authority, and put on some shoes of sonship, make him welcome again. That is what the heart of the father is. We need the revelation of our loving, how kind. Nothing's beyond his reach. Nothing is beyond his reach. Nothing beyond his reach. If you have an orphan spirit, it'll shape the way you think. It'll shape the way you act. It'll shape the way you react in relationships. People can be fatherless for many, many reasons. It doesn't mean necessarily, from a spiritual perspective, you didn't have a natural father. And some fathers are very angry men. Some fathers are very controlling men. Some fathers are very abusive men. When a father abuses the children, their heart is wounded and emotionally, they're fatherless. They now live like an orphan because there's no connection. See, a father may be passive, not responsible, not standing up. He's shut down because he himself was hurt. A father can be irresponsible, leaves everything to his wife. She rises up, takes the role of leading the household, and the father now is failed as a father. There's a pain in the children becomes very noticeable when the child goes through teenage years and they need the father's voice to shape and guide and bring them into identity. I don't go anywhere in the world where I don't find people struggling from issues of an unresolved conflict with a father, unresolved conflict with a mother. They've literally brought the dishonor and the orphan spirit into their walk, and now they want to walk with God, who is a father. Can't be done. You'll have troubles. You'll be a performer, and you won't flow naturally out of a love relationship. So when people are wounded at, at home, perhaps the father betrayed the family, perhaps the father just abandoned the family, it doesn't really matter. Usually what happens, people get wounded in the heart, and the wound is very deep. It's very deep. The father wound is one of the deepest wounds we can have, and it, can't, it needs God to heal it. See, interesting, Jesus came. He said, the Spirit of God is upon me. He's anointed me. Preach the gospel to the poor. In other words, bring people back and connect them to Father. Now I want to heal their heart so they can have a relationship with Father. 
and then I want to deliver them from demons, so now they can actually be free to live with Father, and then I want Father to give them vision for their life and their destiny, and then empower them to fulfill it. But what happens in a church where there's no healing of the broken heart and no deliverance from demonic spirits? Where are people left? Well, they're like the older brother. They're like the older brother. They're like the older brother. Serving, feeling owed, feeling entitled, resentful of the blessings that come to others, struggling for position, struggling without the freedom that sonship brings. They become slaves and servants in a house. It's just, I, it just grieves me. It really grieves me. This, this is a real major issue. And so what happens with both sons is both sons dishonored the father. Now, dishonor has major consequences. Our nation is a nation that dishonors great people. Dishonor sits in the nation. It sits in the nation because of roots of rejection and lack of fatherhood. It is a major issue. It's a major issue in families. It's a major issue in ministry. It's a major issue in church. In Mark chapter 6, Jesus went to his hometown, and this is what it says. It said, he could do no mighty work there. And then it explains why. Because he marveled. What was the problem? Familiarity and dishonor. He spoke it out. Prophets without honor in his own town. He must have come with a heart, thinking of this one with a crippled leg, and that one with the blind eyes, and that one with the leprosy. Man, I'm going to hometown. This is wonderful. He gets to his hometown. He could do no mighty work. In other words, the power of God is activated when you honor, and it is shut down when there's dishonor. A tragedy in our nation is people have dishonored the Holy Spirit, dishonored men of God who started to try and move that way, and started to shut down those ministries. When you come in and minister, you find there's a skepticism. Oh, well, I don't know about that, and I don't know about that, and I don't. And there's like a resistance to the supernatural. It sits in our culture. It sits in the culture, and it's rooted in heart attitudes. You want to release people into their very best? Honor them. Value them. Value every person. Jesus valued every person. We tend to rate people. Oh, this one's more honorable than that one, that one. That one. Jesus valued and honored every person. Because honoring them and frees them to be themselves and talk about the pains they have and open their heart and be healed. Dishonor where you judge and just distance yourself shuts down their capacity because they feel afraid. We're we getting close to home yet. We're getting close to home. So when people are wounded, what do they do? They shut up their heart. They build a wall in the heart. They form bitterness in the heart. You know, it's interesting. The first thing that God dealt with as Israel came out of a bondage, they came through water baptism, baptism of the Spirit. What was the first issue he wanted to deal with? Bitterness. 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 Why? They had been fatherless and in slavery. And the first thing he wants to do after he's got them out of Egypt, through the waters, under the Holy Ghost, now I want to deal with bitterness. Bitterness is a huge issue for people to deal with. Why? Because we don't feel it, but the fruit shows. When people are bitter, they make bitter judgments. They make judgments. Well, I never trust a man. I never trust a woman. I never, and so they begin to make trust, these judgments in the heart. They form vows. I'll never let anyone near me. You know, I, I found people in senior ministry who are struggling. What are they struggling with? They're struggling to try and control the ministry. And they can't because you just can't. You're not God. You can't. And he doesn't. See? It's driven by fear. And so what happens is you start to explore and you find this brokenness. I say, have you forgiven your father? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Forgive my mother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I ask a bit more and the anger starts to come up. So you haven't forgiven anyone yet. You just gave it a bit of a try, but actually it's still alive in your heart. You need to connect that there's pain you've never resolved and it's now affecting your capacity to function. It's a limit on your ministry. I know you pray. I know you fast. I know you seek God to grow, but you know what? You need to deal with your heart. Until you deal with your heart, you can't receive. That's why I find many people don't receive. There's something going on in their heart. So we need to be free in the heart. We need to be free in the heart. We need to be free in the heart. Jesus came to free us in the heart, free us in the heart, came to free us in the heart. That's what we need. Okay? So what do you find? You see, you find in New Zealand, you find all over. These are the kind of things I find everywhere in New Zealand. I find dishonor. 
There's dishonor in the nation. And I just appreciate pastors like Brent Douglas and others who've done their best to build honor back into the nation again. Because honor will release the gifts. Honor releases the, the blessings. It releases the flow from people's life. But under dishonor, there's rejection. People feel rejected. They feel abandoned. They're struggling with rejection from family, struggling with rejection in their life. They're struggling with shame. Shame is a major issue in New Zealand culture. That's why you can't be yourself. Then you become reactive rather than creative. See, bitterness is an issue that I find everywhere. I don't go anywhere I don't find bitterness as a root. It's in our nation. It's in the soul of people. It's, it's, it's eating them out. And when you're bitter, you can't see the good. You just have to compare, and you're always angry about something. You're always focused on injustice and trying to right an injustice. This is true across the nation. doesn't matter what color. doesn't matter what race. It's the same issue because it's a human issue, but it's very strong in New Zealand in the lives of people. We need to deli be delivered from these things. We need to be totally delivered from it. Hey, you're getting quiet now. It must be getting close to home. Now, so what does this do when you come into the church? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'll tell you what happens. You have kings instead of fathers. What's the difference, you say? Oh, well, it's a huge difference. Huge difference. See, king rules a kingdom. And the Bible tells us about King Saul in 1 Samuel, I think, chapter 6. It says, this is the nature of a king. He will take your sons. He will take your daughters. He will take your tithes. He will take this. He will take this. He will take six times the word take is mentioned. That's what kings do. Kings don't leave legacy. They build their kingdom. And they use people to build the kingdom. What does a father do? Well, in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 4, uh, Paul says, he said, uh, well, you have many instructors, but not many fathers. So fathering is, is a problem in his day as well. Uh, many, many instructors in Christ, but not many fathers. Chapter uh, 4 of 1 Corinthians, verse 14 to 17. So, so, so God is restoring apostles. See, an apostle is a spiritual father. What, what is the difference between a king and a father? Oh, there's a huge difference. See, a father is wanting to raise up sons and daughters. A father is wanting a legacy by helping sons and daughters find their identity and come into their destiny, fulfill their call. He's wanting to raise up people who, because of relationship, become builders of the house, not because they're driven to and pressured to. Oh, there's a huge difference between a father and being a king. When I first went to, uh, when I first went to, uh, to Miami to meet with Apostle Mel Nutt, I'd, read, I'd, I'd listened to his material, I had watched uh, him uh, do minister. I had seen and heard many, many things. But when I went there, there was one thing I wanted to know. This was the only question I had. Are you a king or are you a father? Why, why did I want to know that? I'll tell you why. Because I served on the ministries that betrayed me. That while pretending to be one thing, secretly were practicing adultery and then left me abandoned and orphaned spiritually and emotionally. I had my own issues to work through. And coming into a church, I expected someone to father me. And when that father turned out to be a betrayer, it set me back. And then when it happened more than once, it actually happened, I think, four times. Two were very significant. So what happens when you have that happen? Well, it just reinforces I'm on my own. I need to just do my own thing and forget about everyone else. So that brings us to another New Zealand trait, independence. We just want to do our own thing, our own way, and call it ministry. Jesus had something to say about that. Matthew chapter 7, he says, well, many shall say on that day, Lord, Lord, I did this in your name, I did that in your name, I cast out demons, I healed this, I did, I prophesied. He say, depart from me, I never knew you, you're workers of your own thing. Many in that day. So you see, this is why we have to understand the heart of God is a family, a family in right relationship. Apostolic is a ministry of fathering. When I went to apostle, that was the only thing I wanted to know, and this is what I found. I, I, I was asking, see, a father will love you. A father will bless you and provide for you. A father will care for you. A father will comfort you. A father will strengthen you. A father will say, I'm there for you. Can I help you? In my first meeting with apostle, that's exactly all the things he said to me. Then he opened up everything he had said, look, I want to bless you and help you. Whatever you need is yours. This is your family. Apostle. Apostles are fathers. 
A lot of people take on the name apostle, but they're not an apostle. They're a leader or a king, and they've just put another name on. An apostle will move in the supernatural. Apostle will bring the power of God. Apostle will shift the lives of people. Apostle will raise up sons and daughters who love him and really have got a relationship with him. The church needs to get back the spirit of fathering again. See? It needs to get the spirit of father. We need to welcome the ministries of apostles and brothers. Let me just finish with a, a couple of things now. Uh, in, Math, in Malachi chapter 4, verse 7, uh, this is the last closing as, a, aspect of the uh, Old Testament. And, and this is what the prophetic word is, a brilliant word. He said, I will send Elijah before that great and coming day of the Lord, and he shall turn the hearts of fathers to the sons and daughters, and the sons and daughters to the fathers, or the earth will be smitten with a curse. So what God is saying is the end times, uh, one of the great plagues on the earth will be the breakdown in family, the loss of fathers, a fatherless generation. And he says, I'll send the spirit of Elijah, and this is what he'll do. He will turn hearts. Fathers will then turn back to their families. Sons and daughters will be reconciled with their fathers and their mothers again. So what is it? Why did he say, I'll send the spirit of Elijah? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Because that gives the key to what the problem is. Okay? Here's what the problem was. In the days of Elijah, God raised Elijah up with an assignment. The assignment had several facets to it. Number one, he had to tear down, he had to confront the altars of Baal and the Baal worship and the Ashtoreth worship that controlled the nation. Spirit powers had come into the nation through ungodly alliances and agreements, and now there was sexual perversion. There was idolatry. There was child sacrifice, i.e. abortion. There were uh, all kinds of perversions happening. There was poverty in the nation. The nation was literally crippled, and the hearts of the children were broken. Fathers were broken down. The prophets were destroyed. Don't think that that condition was confined to the Old Testament. The same spirits that worked and empowered the people of that day work in our society in the West today doing the same things. These things don't just appear. There's a spirit operating behind them. What did Elijah do? He stood up in the authority God had given him, and he confronted a religious culture. He confronted a culture devoid of power. He confronted a culture that was empty of fathers. He confronted the culture in the power of the Holy Ghost. What was the second thing that he did? Second thing he did, he restored the altar of the Lord. His priority is the altar of the Lord, restoring again the place of the cross at the center of the Christian's walk. I listen, I go to so many churches, I don't hear many songs about the cross. I don't hear a lot of preaching about the cross, but the cross is the power of God. It's by the cross. There's a divine exchange. Oh, I hear a lot of self-improvement stuff. You can make yourself better. You can improve this. You can improve that. But the message of the cross is an exchange. I let go something, and in exchange, I receive empowerment from the Lord. It's an exchange, not a self-help, do better thing. Hallelujah. Think about that. Think about that. Thirdly, he released the supernatural power of God. Apostles will release the power of God and activate others to do it. It's not just they're doing the big thing themselves. An apostle's role is to, oh, oh, it's equip the saints so they'll do it. it. Not to be the one who prays for everyone, but to be the one who empowers everyone. Listen, when apostle came to Hawke's Bay last year, the first night we had 240 miracles and he didn't pray for a person. What he prayed was that the church would become empowered again. We had people with, with metal plates vanish. We had people with organs missing reappear. This is the power of God. This is God coming in supernatural power when you address some of the atmosphere that stops it happening. What else did he do? I'll finish with this. He turned the hearts of a generation. The Bible says the hearts of the generation turn. What do they turn from? They turn from the deception of the culture. They turn from the deception of perversion and immorality and wrong order and disorder in the families and idols and all kinds of substitutes from God, and they turn to the living God. Last thing he did was he empowered the next generation to carry a greater anointing. My, 
How we need the spirit of fathering back again. How we need back in the church a boldness to speak about the issues people are yielding before. How we need in the church a willingness to bring again the cross to the center of our walk. How we need again the ability to bring the supernatural power and set people free. Deliverance, healing, miracles, prophetic flow. That's what he brought back to the church. That's what God is wanting to bring back. That's why you're here, that God might help you and release you and act you. You need to make a response. Let me finish with this. There are many here today, and you are either an emotional or a spiritual orphan. There's some things you need to do. Number one, recognize it. Recognize it. If you've got pain in your heart concerning a natural father or concerning a spiritual father who abused you, it will contribute to you being fatherless for your future. You just can't keep that way. Secondly, we need to repent of holding bitterness, unforgiveness, judgments. We need to repent of those things. Say, well, they've treated me so badly, man, I'm never going to. No, listen, don't do that. Repent of those vows and judgments. Say, God, forgive me. I've tried to protect myself from the pain instead of turning to you. Because when they hurt me like that, I never trusted you after that. I tried to help myself. Say we need to forgive and bless. I did that for quite a long time, forgiving and blessing until my heart was free. Finally, we need to come and have an encounter with the Father's love. Be healed of the rejection, healed of the hurt, healed of the grief, healed of the bitterness, healed of the passivity, set free of the demons that trouble us. I found also what I need to do is this. I had to go and make restoration and put a relationship right. And say, forgive me for what I said and what I did. I really want to honor you and bless you and serve you. Some places you can't do that. There's some relationships you just can't do that. But many times God will say, you need to now make the decision to connect with a spiritual father or maybe put something right, something in your home, something in your background. If you don't do it, you're just like you've only got part of the process. We know we've gone from death to life when we love. So we get out by repenting, releasing forgiveness, letting God touch our heart, letting go of the vows and judgments. Then we're making a decision, I'm going to bless. I'm going to bless. I'm going to bless. I did that with my own father every day. I would bless him, thank God for him. Honor was the gift to give to him. If we want to raise a fatherless generation. We just keep doing business like we are. But if we want something different, then we're the leaders. We've got to carry the Father's heart. Carry the Father's heart. I prayed for a young boy just two, two days ago, and a uh, pastor's son, and just deep fears around his life. And this is what he said. You know, I prayed for him. Immediately, the fear was gone. He just did things he hadn't done before. Quite amazing. He came back and said to his dad, he said, Dad, he said, I felt like a father was talking to me and holding me. See, that's what it means. Jesus brings the reality of Father. He never brought some big administrative empire. He brought the Father to people. Read it again. He brings the Father. This is what Father is like. He's accessible. He's loving. He's generous. He's kind. He's firm. He disciplines. But He lifts us up. I believe today God wants to set many people free. Why don't we stand right now and come? Come, that's you. There's people here going to pray. We're going to release the power of God to set people free. I want to start the night with people being delivered. So tonight, come. Just come. Perhaps you've got an issue with a father naturally, an issue with a mother naturally. You say, God, I want, I want to be touched tonight. Okay. I want you to touch me tonight. Touch me. Please come, come, come. Perhaps you've been abused in a church, abused by a pastor, some spiritual leader, someone who is over you and it's affected your heart. I want you to come. Jesus, I want to encounter you. I want to be set free of my rejection, of my abandonment, of my bitterness, of the grief in my heart. I want to be set free. Come, 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 come. Come now, come now. It's your time to encounter. God is here. God is here to touch us. The 
the power of God is here to set people free. Come, make your way up. Make your way down the aisles. Come, come. This is your time to encounter him. He wants to set you free. He wants to deliver you. To break the power of that rejection. Break the power of that abandonment. Break the power of that control. Break the power of that bitterness. Break that addiction. Break that false comfort. Break that fear off your life. As you're standing here with your hands lifted and you're watching on the TV, stand with your hands lifted. Come before Father. Repent. 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 Father, I'm so sorry. I've been angry. I've been bitter. I've been struggling with all kinds of uncleanness. I'm struggling with shame. I'm struggling with fear. Father, help me. Help me. Help me. Help me. Help me. Help me. I believe. I believe you will deliver me. This will leave my life. If you're watching on TV, you can pray the prayer with us. And then the power of God will come. Some of you are carrying injustice. Oh, it was so unjust what happened. So unfair. But God is saying to you, let it go. Let it go. Let me deliver you. Some of you are wrestling because of the sins of your father. Generational sins. God wants to set you free of generational curses. His power will come. He will touch you. Lift your hands to the Lord right now. I will lead you in a prayer. At the end of the prayer, I want us all to worship God together. We're going to sing highest praises. We're going to lift the name of Jesus very high. When we do that, the ministry team are going to come and lay hands on you. As soon as they lay hands on you, stop singing, stop praying. Just receive deliverance. Breathe out. Whatever's inside you, let it go. Let it go. The hatred, the anger, the fear, the bitterness, the shame, the sexual sin, the false, the addictions, the false comforts, the fantasies, whatever that thing is that got around your life, let it go. As people minister, it'll break off your life. Follow me in this prayer. Father in heaven, I come to you in Jesus' name. I can't hear you. Let's do that again. Father in heaven, I come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you for loving me, for loving me, for sending Jesus to die on the cross, to break the power of sin, break the curse of orphan, break the orphan curse, and send me free. Tonight, Father, I choose to forgive. I forgive those who've hurt me. Every fa my Father, every minister, Every leader, every person who hurt me deeply, I forgive them. I release them. Now, Father, tonight I receive deliverance, healing, release from an orphan spirit. Tonight, Father, I belong to you. I belong to you. I belong to you. I, to you. I am loved. I am free now, in Jesus' name. Come on, let's worship the Lord. Ministry team, come and begin to pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, I bring generational curses. I bring curses of abuse, curses of abandonment, illegitimacy. I bring the curses now, in Jesus' name. Spirits of fear, spirits of grief, spirits of bitterness, go. I break every death wish. Spirits of death, go. Tormenting spirits, go. Go. Spirits of self-hate, go. Spirits of self-rejection, go. Spirits of witchcraft, go. 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 Go in Jesus' name. Loose, 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 loose.
Come on, team, release the power of God. Release the power of God. Tormenting spirits, go, go, go. Fear, go, go. Catch us, catch us. Get ready to catch quickly. Tormenting spirits, go. Spirits of aversion, go. Spirits of pornography, go. Unclean spirits, go. Spirits of homosexuality, go. Of trauma, go.
Distracted, many people are getting delivered and set free here on the altar. But let me ask, I'm one of uh, the pastors with Apostle Maldonado's team. How many of you are sick in your body that you need healing in any, perhaps you have herniated discs, asthma, migraines, cancer? Can I see your hand if you could raise your hand if you need healing in your body? Can you raise your hand? I'm going to ask our team if you guys can go on our pastors to go help us. Keep your hands up because somebody's going to get to you. I saw a woman that was getting healed from herniated this. The presence of God is here. And as you worship, he's bringing deliverance to you. He's bringing healing to you. People who are deaf in one of your ears, of both of your ears, I want you to just keep your hands up. I want to ask the pastors to go. And begin to pray for these people because the miracles are happening now if you came crippled if you have metals in your body God is healing you there is a woman you have metals in your hip you're gonna feel the power of God healing you some of you are gonna feel the heat in your body the presence of the Lord is here healing people miracles are happening people who suffer from migraine headaches are getting healed cataracts blindness is getting healed just lift your hands and receive it just receive it directly from God someone will come and pray for you but as you and your seed and you worship you are being healed now father in the name of Jesus we send your word we command everyone in this place that is sick to be healed as they stand in your presence healings are taking place miracles I see creative miracles that are taking place there is a woman that you heal from cysts in your ovaries you're gonna feel the heat touching your ovaries that's the power of God touching you hey be healed now be healed now Many of you that are still getting delivered, receive your miracle now. Those cysts are disappearing. Those cysts are disappearing. You're going to feel the pop in your ear. Ears are being opened. Hallelujah. Come on, let's sing it together one more time. Yes, Jesus. Hey. Jesus. There you go. You're feeling the power of God in your womb. You feel the power of God coming upon you. Why? Because when the presence comes, it comes for a reason. It comes with a purpose. It comes to deliver. It comes to set free. It comes to restore. I command new organs. Many of you that needed organs in your body. That is a young boy. You get it healed from one of your lungs. Jesus is putting a brand new lung in you. Deaf ears are being opened. Blind eyes are being opened. It's happening now. Now, let it go. So receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Men are healed. Men are getting healed from tumors. I see tumors that are disappearing. It's happening. It's happening already. Miracles are happening already. I command those tumors to dry up now. Jesus, Jesus, let it go. Do what you couldn't do. If you came crippled, if you came with a cane, with a crutch, let it go. Begin to walk now. Come on, let's sing it all together. Jesus, receive your healing now. Those 
those that are watching on the internet the power of God is reaching you at home healing you I see a man you blind from your left eye you're feeling a heat in your eye Jesus just open your eyes I see children getting healed children getting healed asthma is leaving migraines are leaving diabetes is leaving metals in the body are turning to flesh and bones tumors are disappearing cysts I see a woman you came with cysts in your left breast the power of God just touched you the power of God just touched you that cyst left you are healed tonight if you're feeling the power of God already I gotta ask you to go either to the right or to go to the left begin to do what you couldn't do if you came with asthma start moving around start running around if you came with her there is a man you came with herniated discs in your back I see people already moving getting healed a man that came with herniated discs in your back the power of God just touched you you felt the heat in your back those herniated this God just put brand new this in your back Amen. I want you to begin to do what you couldn't do before yeah. if you came sick begin to do what you couldn't do before pastors are moving all across the building the stage the seats but just quickly find someone you felt that ear that you were having trouble hearing just popped Jesus just opened that ear there was a woman you came you haven't smelled in years you lost the sense of smelling the power of God just touched you and recreated the glands that you needed that's it if you're beginning to move come on grandma move move do what you couldn't do before do what you couldn't do before do what you couldn't do before there we go come on answer just bring him to the right bring him to the sides quickly 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 bring him to the sides Anto. bring him to the side to the side let's bring him to the side come to the sides you're gonna see the team there on the left and the team on the right you're gonna see the team on both sides begin to do what you couldn't do before quickly 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 the testimonies are already the healings that are already Hallelujah. taking place. But I want you to remain standing. And those of you that also, you were not in, in the encounter with us last year. And you have a testimony. We want you to come to the left and we want you to come to the right so you can testify. How many of you have received with Apostle Mike Arnold? Come on, can you put your hands together for the Apostle Mike? Come on, give Jesus a big praise. Come on, can you give Jesus a big praise today? No, but that's kind of like... I said, can you give Jesus a big praise? Come on, I want to hear you shout. Come on. Come on. Somebody shout out to Jesus today. Hey. God is here. Look. Look at this. A miracle. Another one. Thank you, Lord. There's many miracles taking place. This is two days of miracles. Two days of miracles. Listen. Get on the phone. Talk to your friends. Get them here tonight. We've got a fantastic cultural welcome organized by Pastor Luca. New wine team from Miami will be here. Lifting us to a totally different level of worship. Apostle Maldonado will be here. You're in for an amazing time. Get your friends. Ring them. Get them to come. Just get on your phone now. Tell them, come, come, come. Miracles will be here tonight. Bring sick people. Bring people of trouble that need free.
Come on, let's give Jesus a shout of praise this evening. Come on, let's lift his name up. Thank you so much. I really hope you uh, got blessed by that session with Apostle Mike, Dad. It's a powerful message.